Section 1. You will hear a student talking to the study abroad coordinator at her university. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hi, Leela. Please sit down. So you were interested in studying abroad next year, right? Yes, that's right. I've always wanted to live and study in South America. OK, well, I have to go over a few things with you first, Leela. Once I get some information, I can tell you about studying abroad. What is your last name? Kim. That's K-I-M-H. OK, now, when are you interested in studying abroad? I want to study my entire third year of university abroad. Wow, that's a long while, but well worth it. Have you ever lived or studied abroad before? Yes, I took a summer language program in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Will you be applying for financial aid for your year abroad? I think I will be. Living costs are lower in South America, but plane tickets can be very expensive. What kind of degree do you want? I plan to obtain a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish and Latin American History. I'm especially interested in how countries there became democracies. That sounds very interesting. Do you have any idea what countries you want to study in? I think I'll do one semester in Bolivia and then another semester in Peru. That's all the basic information I need. Just ask if you need anything else. Before you hear the rest of the dialogue, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Now, Leela, there are some things I have to explain to you about going abroad for a year. You know that it can be difficult at times. Yes, actually, I had a friend who went to China for just a semester. She said the language barrier was quite a problem. Actually, not only is there a language barrier, there are also cultural differences that can make living or studying in another country very difficult. You mentioned going abroad before, but over the course of a year, some people can experience severe loneliness. I think I'm prepared to deal with that. Also, you have to be organized when it comes to applying for your study abroad program. Our university here may not accept every course you take abroad. You have to make sure with your academic advisor about which ones are appropriate and will count towards your degree. Understood. Thanks for the advice. Actually, I did want to go over the application procedure briefly with you. I read it on the website, but... Yes, it can be slightly confusing. First of all, please remember to keep your grade point average at 3.2 or above. There are high standards for those sponsored by the school to study in another country. Once you have declared your major, you can begin your research into which programs you want to go to. After filling out the appropriate application, you will submit them to the Office of Study Abroad. After they review your materials, you will be informed about whether or not you can study abroad under the university's name. You will also be informed about how much financial aid you will receive. Sounds slightly daunting. Well, from what I have seen, I don't think you need to worry. OK, then. I'll print the forms from the online website now and get started. Good luck, Leela. Thank you so much. No problem. If you have any other questions, please email or call. I will. Bye then. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear Laura talk about this year's International Food Festival. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning, everyone. Today we have a special guest speaker. Laura Lanthor is director of the International Food Festival this year. Laura, can you tell us about what to expect at the festival? Of course, Vincent. This spring, people in the city can go to the 7th Annual International Food Festival. This is a special event for the whole family. I do have to tell you, though, we are holding it at a different date than before. Easter is exceptionally early this year, and if the festival were held as usual, it would have fallen on the same weekend. This year, the festival will be held on the first week of April, before Easter. The festival will be held at the Walker Field Grounds and will be divided into four main areas. There will be a Western food area with authentic representations of European cuisine. There will also be an East Asian section with chefs and products from Japan, Korea, and China. A South Asian section will have food from India, Vietnam, Thailand, and Indonesia. For the first time this year, we will also have a Latin American section where people can try things from Mexico, various Caribbean countries, and South America. There will also be special booths where people can learn about all these cuisines. This year, we are expanding the cooking workshop and demonstration portion of the festival. Attendees last year really seemed to like learning about food and having a hands-on experience. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. I'll give you a brief description of three of the workshops we have. Like I said, these allow you to participate directly in the making of food and teach you techniques you can use at home. For a full list of them, please go to our online website. We will give you the site address after the end of my talk. You will also find there the procedure to pre-register for the workshops. Pre-registration takes place when you buy your festival tickets and is highly recommended. Non-Western food has become increasingly popular these days and many people are interested in how to cook such food at home. Such cuisines use a variety of different spices, ones that aspiring cooks might not be familiar with. Therefore, our World Tour of Spices is a good introduction to the flavor profiles of other cuisines. I would recommend it for adults who want to seriously learn about cooking. Small children might not take to the more exotic spices. One workshop that is meant for children is Candy Adventures. There are traditional activities like making gingerbread houses. Other activities teach basic decorating techniques, including the proper use of coloring dye. Kids can also learn how to make flowers and other objects out of cake frosting. We understand the concerns of parents regarding their children's health, so everything used in this workshop is either sugar-free or uses acceptable sugar substitutes. Lastly, we have a workshop that is suitable for the whole family. Salads Forever is a workshop for everyone interested in healthy eating. There will be different kinds of salads that people can try and demonstrations that show how to make them. Salads have grown in popularity these days and are a healthy addition to any diet, if prepared the right way. The workshop will also teach how to make healthy salad dressings. I'm afraid that's all I have today. Please visit the festival website for more details. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a conversation in a continuing education institute's office. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Holtz. Hello, Jeremy. I was told to come to this office and ask about your continuing education program. I'm interested in taking classes and want to know more about the program. Certainly. We have several different programs depending on your education goals and on what you are doing now. For example, we have continuing education programs for those who want to finish a degree or start a new one, and we also have a program for working adults. Well, I'm working part-time now, and I'm interested in completing a degree in business administration. I am working at a hospital, you see, but I want to change my job, either work in hospital management or have my own business. OK, that sounds great. Many students in our program want to advance in their current careers or even change them. What kind of degree do you have now? I am a registered nurse with a two-year degree. Great. First, we have to figure out where you want to take classes. We have satellite campuses all over the region. The ones at the city centre are accessible by public transportation but offer fewer course times. A car is the best way to attend classes at our satellite campuses in the suburbs, but they have more classrooms and therefore more courses. Well, I have been saving up for a car, but I don't have enough money to buy one yet. I think the city centre campus will be better. OK. Now we have to decide which program you want to register for. We have night courses, where the classes generally run from 7pm to 10pm. Classes during these hours are usually once a week. There are also courses during the day that might work for you, depending on your work schedule. Well, like I said, I'm working part-time and unfortunately I work during the evenings. You see, I'm living at my parents' house right now. My father is quite ill, actually, and since my mother works normal hours, I take care of him during the day and my mom takes care of him in the evening when I work. The city centre campus doesn't offer classes during the weekends? No, the suburban one does, but unfortunately there are no classes during that time at the city centre campus. You know, maybe the online courses will be better for you. Do you have access to the internet? Yes, I have a computer at home. That might be the best way for you then. It's still a new program. We're still working out the bugs, but it will allow you to work part-time, take care of your father, and take classes. The completion of your degree will probably take longer, however. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So, how exactly does this work? I'm slightly nervous about studying again. It's been years since I've been a student. Yes, it can be a bit daunting at times. Continuing your education and improving yourself are well worth the effort. Actually, before you start taking online classes, there are several refresher courses that you are required to take. What kind of courses are those? These are especially made for the returning adult student. We understand that education is just one of a number of priorities for those that take classes with us. The refresher courses teach you how to manage time and juggle between different areas in your life. Techniques like writing down your daily schedule and ways to avoid procrastinating are talked about. Also, there is one course that reviews basic study skills, like the most efficient way to read the course text as well as basic academic writing. I think that would be really helpful for me. I enjoyed studying when I was going to school, but I definitely need some tips on how to manage my classes along with the rest of my life. Many students I've seen are in a similar position. They have to balance both their work and family life with their education. It's not easy, 
but it is very rewarding for the ones that finish their education all the way through. Okay, so how do I register for the classes? You need to go online to do that. I will give you a brochure with the appropriate web address. You can choose which course modules to take online. You can go through them as time allows. There is even a place to keep track of progress towards your degree. All right. Can I ask then about the cost of the online courses? They are cheaper than classes at either campus, of course. Online, you'll see a number of different ways to pay. You can pay up front for each course module you take, or pay over a number of months. The latter method of payment will probably be better for me. Are the textbooks and other course materials expensive? No, not at all, actually. With all online courses, the relevant materials are included free of charge. They are available to download after you register. That sounds great. Thank you so much. No problem. My contact information is also in the brochure. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. And to section four. Section four. You will hear a student representative explaining the views of the student body about how a large donation to the school should be spent. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for asking the student body about the recent large donation to our school and what it should be spent on. Also, thank you to the rest of the Board of Trustees for letting us have some say over how to improve our university. We know that sometimes students and administration have different priorities regarding the development of the school, but we hope you sincerely consider some of the ideas that are proposed. When the estate of Paul A. Madrib announced that he had left over fifty million dollars to the school, the whole community was quite ecstatic and very grateful for such a generous gift. Since the initial euphoria has passed, though, we have all realized that some tough decisions have to be made. The donation can help fund new projects for the school or improve existing facilities and programs, but there is not enough money to pay for every single idea. That is why the university senate. Through an online survey, asked the student body what ideas they thought were best. The first part of this survey consisted of an open question. Students could list any number of different ideas. The results were then compiled in order to do a second online survey. Ideas that were totally impossible or those that were jokes were taken out. All the ideas that consistently came up again and again were put to a vote. We found that the four things that came up the most were all pretty different. I will mention them briefly before going over the pros and cons of each of them. In the first part of the survey, we saw over and over again that students wanted to improve the residential dormitories, completely redo the campus dining system, remodel the athletics building, and finally increase funding for research projects and grants, especially for those in science. Obviously, there is not enough money from the donation to pay for all those ideas, so we have to prioritize. The ideas that got the most votes were improving the residential dormitories and completely redoing the campus dining system. They both got 30 percent and 28 percent, respectively, of students saying that was what most of the money should be spent on. Many of the dorm facilities are quite old and definitely need some repair, particularly the shared bathrooms. Also, students have been complaining for a while that there is not an adequate number of dining facilities on campus. And that the quality of the food at existing places is low. Spending most of the donation in these areas would definitely improve the quality of life on campus. However, 
a significant minority of the student population, about 40%, does not live on campus. They commute from their homes elsewhere and therefore would not benefit from those improvements. 25% of students thought improving the athletics building was the best use of the money and 17% voted for giving money to research projects for science. There are many people who are attracted to our university because of our athletics programs, so improving the building would improve the reputation of the university. Only a small percentage of students actually ever use the athletics building, however. Though it received the fewest votes, giving money to university research projects has great potential. Any new patents that come about because of that research can possibly earn the school lots of money. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.